In a world bound by iron laws, where ancient ritual and order reign supreme, and the governing motto is no change, two youth rise up to shake the castle walls. Titus Grown, the rebellious 77th Earl and heir to the decaying castle, and Steerpike, a conniving kitchen boy determined to rise above his lowly position to control the house of Grown. Evil is afoot in the halls of Gormenghast. I first came across Gormagast in 2008, when Stephen Malloy directed a brilliant production at the University of British Columbia. It was a strange play, weird even, but has sat with me ever since. I was drawn to the darkness and the distortion of the characters. These weren't normal people, and this wasn't a normal world. Having grown up on the fantasy worlds of C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, Terry Brooks, I admired the boldness of such an epic fantasy on stage. I was intrigued by the challenges that staging this monstrous play provided. In film, challenges like falling from a tower, fires, underwater scenes are easily addressed with locations and technology. But on stage, how do we make those moments theatrical, magical even? I saw this as a challenge for me as a director, but I also saw this as a great opportunity for the students at Brock to play in a different world and embody different kinds of characters than they might normally get the chance to. These characters are all larger than life, bizarre, twisted, strange. As an actor, roles like that don't come up very often. But I'm drawn to plays that give opportunity for large physical choices, and I knew that I wanted to approach this play in um, a lens or framework of physical theater. But each time I came back to the play, I questioned, what style are we working in? Is this melodrama? Is this gothic drama? Where does this play sit? As we dove into the world of the play in our design meetings, trying to define the world of the play, I came to the realization that this play is not pure in any one style, but rather a combination of many styles. To me, Gormagast is a collage of theatrical styles, a, a hybrid with this as the focus, the doors opened up and I began to see the world of Gormagast in a whole new light. We are creating a fantasy world here, and all fantasy worlds have imagination. The imagination for me is affected by all our different influences and experiences throughout our lives. Bits and pieces coming together to create a cohesive whole. We need to embrace all the impulses and stimuli that make sense in a fantasy world. We need to create a, a world with its own set of rules and its own structure. And for us in Gormenghast, that embraced a number of different theatrical styles. And the glue that holds all of that together for me is the physical. Space, distance, shape, body, gesture, and action. These are all very important elements and have really driven my vision of this production. The world of this play is asymmetrical and unstable. It's a world where a legacy of tradition and balance will be undone by the choices of the characters as they set the foundation for an outcome that may present a new horizon for understanding, or it may not. 
An image gleaned from the production activities at the Hearn Generating Station in Toronto during the 2016 Luminato Festival quickly became a touchstone for decay and initiatives of revitalization. Additional visual research has included sites of urban decay and seemingly random acts of organization or the discovery of order in chaos. Similarly, the costume design is founded upon collage that speaks of a time after, a world of post-experience, a mashup of colors, textures, and silhouettes that reveal intimate histories of the unbalanced and unwashed characters, all founded on stories written into the crusty books of the Gormenghast Library and situated in a future not yet known. We are inviting you into a unique multi-level configuration of the Marilyn I. Walker Theatre, where the public seating risers, mezzanine gallery, and lighting grid gantry are all populated by the actors' journeys across the story of the play. Be prepared to be surprised. The style of melodrama performance is unique. It is presentational and expresses extreme emotions through voice and stylized movements and facial gestures. A lot of the elements traditionally that melodrama highlights are peppered throughout our production. The play is structured in a fast, episodic way. The scenes are short and clip along from one moment to the next, providing us with suspense, anticipation, and urgency. The characters in Gormenghast could easily be considered stock. However, we have looked at these stock characters as a foundation for us to build on. In our production, the characters are much larger in scale physically, mentally, and emotionally. James L. Smith writes in his book, Melodrama, quote, No time is lost fooling about with motivation, for there is no pretense that these are real people. A single epithet defines them, end quote. But in the world of Gormenghast, nothing is what we expect, and many of the characters are conflicted and torn in multiple directions. The play is governed by an overruling sense of right and wrong, as the castle runs on the structure of ancient rules and rituals. The style is heightened and generally over the top, however, it is not false or fake. The characters are authentic and honest in their feelings, they just express them in larger-than-life ways. As for the happy ending, we will let you decide. When we look at Gormenghast, we see a fictional fantasy world that is very different than reality. However, the world, situations, and characters can easily be compared to today's society. A power-hungry man willing to pillage and plunder to rise to the top, rebellion against conformity or authority. We can see these themes today and throughout history. In the structure of the play, there is a brilliant mix of comedy and horror. In one moment, we see extreme violence, and then in the next, we're turned around with comedy. Sometimes even both emerge out of one moment. In Constable's Gormenghast, with the embellished importance of the mundane rituals and their cyclical nature, there is a blind faith and belief in the ways of the past. Therefore, many characters lack purpose and identity and are often defined by their role in the castle and not by their actions. The link to puppetry is strong in Gormenghast as we are using puppets in multiple ways, literally and figuratively. So puppetry has been hugely impactful for my character. Uh, not only just using the puppets because I have a, a raven puppet and I also have my own cat puppet, but seeing the chorus work with their puppets and working with them is just, it's just so fantastic. And um, it really, really makes me understand the relationship between the Countess and our animals versus the Countess and the other people in the castle. Many of the characters in the play take on the role of puppet or puppeteer in their relationships with others. The style of the grotesque is concerned with the distortion and transgression of boundaries, be they physical or psychological. So, theater of the grotesque in terms of how far we're going and how far away from normal it is, we're really supposed to be other in this show. So, pushing it so far beyond human and beyond anything that you would ever do has really been what I focused on. As we explore many of our heightened moments of action in Gormenghast, we are influenced by Grand Guignol and its technique of tension and release in creating suspense and the anticipation for the audience. Though we will certainly have moments of blood on stage, the style of Grand Guignol has been inspiring to think about how to explore violence through different ways of theatricality and stage magic. 
Another major influence from our research into Grand Guignol has been the notion of other. This has affected how we've looked at Steerpike as a character from elsewhere, and that nature of otherness has really shaped his character and relationships in the play. When first diving into Gormenghast, the world presented itself as very masculine, with male succession to the throne as a driving theme. However, as we dove deeper into conversations about the play, we started to think about gender fluidity. Though on the surface the characters were framed two specific genders, at a deeper level the characters defied their gendered stereotypes by performing against traditional patriarchal expectations. Performing gender became an important idea within the ensemble, with much of our inspiration coming from the work of gendered theorist Judith Butler, who believes that gender identity is, quote, stylized repetition of acts through time, end quote. From here, we began asking questions about the notion of gendered performativity. Who is performing gender, and how are they defying traditional notions of gender? For instance, in our production, a number of women go against their gender roles through the actions and relationships they engage in in the play. For instance, the Countess is first presented as the childbearer, but soon breaks down the normal expectations of that role when she doesn't want anything to do with the child, and transforms into warrior mode by the end of the play. Flay and Titus are two other characters with which we have explored the idea of gendered flexibility. Mike and I have talked a lot about Flay's gender and we thought that it would be an interesting choice to make Flay a born female who presents male and masculine almost like a drag king. And the reason I think that choice is important is because it shows uh, the female adaptability in a male's world because primarily the characters of Gormenghast, the higher up characters like Sepulcrave and Titus, are male characters, the ones who have power. I think that the feminine qualities like his emotional state and his, his love for his family drive him to become a cold, um, masculine character at the end. I think it very much influences how he is at the end because he no longer wants to feel emotion, he no longer wants to, to love the things that he did because it's broken now. They're gone, so he feels like he's forced to become a warrior, masculine, manly man. When we began our process for the show early in the beginning of the year, it was important that we created a feeling of community and collaboration with the ensemble, building a strong foundation for the physical work in the show. We started the ensemble off with a three-day intensive, which focused on finding a foundation for each character's physicality and developing ritual gestures that would become important for the ritual work and the physical vocabulary of the show. This consisted of the ensemble preparing and bringing in a number of different starting points for exploration, including daily ritual gestures they might do in everyday lives, uh, three different animal physicalities, three images inspired by their characters, and a word that described the entirety of the show. These elements became prompts for the cast to physically explore the world, a world that is so much larger than ours in scale and scope. As we explored, we wanted to stray away from the idea of normalcy, but we often began exploring normal or everyday gestures or physical choices and then transformed them into a larger scale, morphing them something closer to the scale of Gormenghast, making them more Gormenghasty, a term we playfully coined. As the process continued, the ensemble explored more physical work through lab and effort actions and image-based inspirations, building upon their early physical discoveries. This layer of work added specificity to movement and clarity to character personalities. Throughout the rehearsal period, we have continued to push the specifics of the physical body in space and action, focusing on each character being detailed and individual in their stance and locomotion and gesture. With a cast of distorted, bizarre, and larger-than-life characters, we see the castle thrown into turmoil and chaos. Fires burn, swords slash, and the flood waters rise in this epic fantasy that questions the ways of the past. But is there a brighter future? <laughs>